How's it going, everybody? Daner here with North Central Coins, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the most rare and valuable coins in Canada. Today, we're going to be taking a look at 10 must-know Canadian coins with big money potential. Every single one of the coins that we discussed today, although extremely rare, is not impossible to find. And in this video, we will explore each of these rare pieces of currency and delve into why they hold such incredible value in Canadian numismatics. Additionally, we will discuss any distinguishing and identifying features, their significance among collectors, and also the potential value if you happen to find or own a legitimate example. Before I do get into this, I would really appreciate if you guys would smash that thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and also ring that bell notification so you can stay up to date with my new content as it is being released. And then without any further ado, what do you say we take a look at 10 must-know Canadian coins with big money potential? Let's get it, guys. The Blue Nose was launched in March 1921 from Lunenburg Harbor and quickly gained fame as the swiftest fishing schooner worldwide. Not only did it secure a record catch on the Grand Banks in its inaugural season, but it also brought the International Fisherman's Trophy to Nova Scotia. The Blue Nose maintained an undefeated status in racing for almost two decades, earning the title Queen of the North Atlantic Fishing Fleet. Its international representation included notable appearances at events such as the Chicago World's Fair in 1933 and His Majesty King George V's Silver Jubilee in 1935. Contrary to its name, the Blue Nose actually had a black and red hull with a yellow strip. The term Blue Nose had been a moniker for Nova Scotians since at least the year 1785. The coin's reverse was designed by Yves Baroub and showcases an angled view of the blue nose under a full sail and heeled to port on an open sea. This dynamic portrayal is available in both colored and uncolored versions, both of which bear the double-dated inscription 1921 to 2021. The colored version is groundbreaking for a 10 cent circulation coin, featuring blue highlights that represent the deep waters of the North Atlantic. The obverse side features the effigy of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Now even though these commemorative design dimes from the year 2021 are incredibly revolutionary and beautiful, it is actually the single date plain design for the 2021 dime that you are looking for. Now as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, there are actually four different designs for the 2021 dime. The first is the colored blue nose, then there is the uncolored commemorative blue nose design, then there is the double date which will have the date of 1921 to 2021. And then there is the single date dime, which will only have the date of 2021. And that is the one that you want to look for. The mintage of a coin refers to the total number of copies produced, and it plays a crucial role in determining a coin's rarity and potential value in the collector's market. In the context of the four different designs for Canadian dimes in the year 2021, the regular design with a single date has a much lower mintage compared to the other three designs, making it more valuable and rare for several different reasons. Distribution and Circulation The regular design of a coin is often the one intended for general circulation, and these coins are distributed widely for everyday transactions. Usually special or commemorative designs will be produced in smaller quantities and may not be as widely circulated, but in the case of the single date 2021, it is actually the opposite. Collector interest. Collectors often show a keen interest in special or limited edition coin designs, leading to a higher demand for these coins. Usually the regular designs, being more common and part of everyday transactions, might not attract the same level of collector attention initially. But this is actually something that adds to the intrigue and allure of this single day 2021, as because it does not stand apart from any other Canadian dime, in terms of its design, they can easily slip under the radar of normal coin muggles, I guess we will call them. Now, when I say coin muggle, I am not trying to say it in a derogatory sense, but basically it is a term that I will use for anyone that doesn't have any knowledge of numismatics, and they might actually let a coin that is worth a lot of money go in an everyday transaction. That's why it is always good to arm yourself with a little bit of knowledge, that way you don't accidentally let a coin into circulation that is worth hundreds or thousands of dollars by mistake. 
Minting decisions. Mintage decisions are made by the mint and they're based on factors such as public demand, commemorative events, and overall coin production requirements. Regular designs are typically minted in larger quantities to meet the demands of daily commerce, while special designs may have limited mintages. Now, my best guess when it comes to the 2021 single date dime is that the Canadian Mint didn't actually have a really good plan in 2021 for how they were going to roll out the commemorative dimes. They may have actually struck some of the single date dimes at the beginning, and then when they eventually planned or introduced the double date dimes with the date of 1921 to 2021, they may have actually switched up and produced a larger quantity of those. And because they had already made a decent amount of the single dates initially, they just released them into circulation and gave them out to banks. A similar situation would probably be with the 1991 quarters that have a very low mintage of around 450,000. Marketing and promotion. Special designs are often actively marketed and promoted by the mint, generating additional interest and demand. Regular designs may not receive the same level of promotional effort, which actually probably made the 2021 single date fly under the radar a little bit. Due to these factors and its lower mintage, coupled with the potential lower initial collector interest, can contribute to its rarity and consequently its increased value among collectors over time. However, the actual rarity and value will depend on the coin's condition and also the collector landscape for that particular year. Now, some of the details and specifications for the 2021 single date Canadian dime, if any of these are off, it may indicate that it is not an authentic example. It is composed of 92% steel, 5.5% copper, and 2.5% nickel. It has a weight of 1.75 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.22 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Susanna Blunt and Suzanne Taylor for the obverse and Emmanuel Hahn for the reverse. The edge is reeded, it is magnetic, and has a die axis and metal alignment, which is the standard for most Canadian, Australian, and British coins. Now, in terms of value, this is not a coin that you're going to get rich off of today. This is one that definitely has the potential to increase in value over time. And if you were to find one and it had any errors or anything special or notable about it, it may add to its value quite substantially. But it cannot be stated enough how rare these things are and how small your chances actually are of ever stumbling upon one of these in your pocket change. If you're a coin roll hunter, you might get lucky and find one of these every couple of boxes. But chances are you're going to have to search and search if you want to find one of these bad boys. Now, in terms of value on the low end, it doesn't hold too much of a premium, but I would say you can probably get around a dollar for one of these, even if it's beat up, worn, and been put through the meat grinder. But the good news is it's a fairly recent dime, only two years old as I'm making this video. So chances are most of them are going to be in pretty good shape at this point still. But if you were able to find one and it scores at the high end of the Sheldon scale, so that is an MS67, you can get around $100 for this right now. Now, it is by far the most rare and valuable of all the different 2021 dimes that you can find. And I have no doubt that in 10 or 20 years, its value could easily increase tenfold. The Canadian $2 coin, known officially as the Toonie, was first issued on February 19, 1996 by Minister of Public Works Diane Marleau. Its French name is Piece de $2 Canadiens, often known as Two Piastres or Two Piastres Round. It has the greatest current market value of any Canadian coin as of 2023. The Toonie is a bimetallic coin with a polar bear illustration by artist Brent Townsend on one side, like all other coins now in circulation on Canada, Queen Elizabeth II is featured on the obverse. The text Elizabeth II slash DG Regina text is written in a font that is distinctive from other Canadian coins. A patented distinctive bimetallic coin locking mechanism is used to create the coin. The expected lifespan of the coin is 20 years. The no longer in circulation Canadian $2 bill actually costs less to produce but has a much shorter lifespan of just one year. The Looney and Toonie have undergone several design revisions including new security elements according to the Royal Canadian Mint which they unveiled on April 10, 2012. Prior to 2012, the inner core of Canadian Toonies were composed of aluminum bronze coated with multiply plated brass while the outside ring was composed of steel coated with multiply plated nickel. 
Previously, coins had an aluminum bronze inner core and a pure nickel outer ring. The thickness lowered from 1.8 to 1.75 millimeters and the weight decreased from 7.30 to 6.92 grams. The smaller denominations of Canadian coinage already use multiply plated steel technology according to the mint which produces an electromagnetic signature that is more difficult to forge than that of standard alloy coins. Additionally, employing steel results in cost savings and prevents variations in the price or supply of nickel. Since many of the notable security measures were not implemented until the year 2012, there have been several cases and reports of Canadian counterfeit tunies. I have actually stumbled across them myself. In some of my coin roll hunts, they are pretty easy to tell apart. Usually you can tell by the pointy nose on the queen and what they call the camel toe on the polar bear. But that is definitely the small downside when it comes to producing coins out of steel and cheaper alloys is that it makes them a lot easier to counterfeit when they do not have advanced security measures. The word toonie is a combination of the numeral 2 and the name of the Canadian $1 coin currently used in circulation, the loony. Although it is often misspelled T-W-O-N-I-E or T-W-O-O-N-I-E, Canadian publications and the Royal Canadian Mint officially use the word and spelling T-O-O-N-I-E. In honor of the Inuit and their northern culture, Jack Ayurak Anawak, a member of parliament from an aboriginal tribe located in Nunavut, proposed the name Nanook. However, this suggestion was largely overlooked in favor of the well-known Tuni. The Royal Canadian Mint acquired the rights to the name Tuni in 2006 since it had gained such widespread acceptance. Following a contest to give the bear a name, Churchill was chosen, paying homage to both Winston Churchill and frequent sightings of polar bears in Churchill, Manitoba. Finance Minister Paul Martin announced the replacement of the $2 banknote with a coin in the year 1995 in the Canadian Federal Budget speech. The Royal Canadian Mint then spent $17,400 Canadian to canvas 2,000 Canadian households regarding which of the 10 theme options they preferred. Under the direction of C. Truong, the Royal Canadian Mint Engineer Division designed the $2 coin to be made from two different metals. The metals for the bimetallic coin would be lighter and thinner than those produced anywhere in the world at the time. To join the two parts, the engineering division selected a bimechanical locking mechanism. By the end of 1996, the Winnipeg facility had struck 375 million of these coins, and the coin was officially launched at Ben's Deli in Montreal on February 19, 1996. The community of Campbellford, Ontario, home to the coin's designer, constructed an 8-meter tall or 26-foot toonie monument similar to the Big Looney in Echo Bay and the iconic Big Nickel in Sudbury. Unlike the loony, the toonie and $2 bill were not being produced at the same time as each other, as the $2 bill was withdrawn from circulation on February 16, 1996, three days prior to the toonie's introduction. Some of the original toonies that were released for circulation actually had a defect. When the first batch of toonies were struck hard or frozen, some of the coins might separate due to a malfunction in the bimetallic locking mechanism. The Royal Canadian Mint reacted by saying that there was a 1 in 60 million chance of a toonie falling apart, despite media reports of defective toonies. Section 456 of the Canadian Criminal Code defines defacing coin currency as purposely attempting to split a toonie. This is actually a criminal offense in Canada. Now what do you say we get into the toonie that you guys all came here to find out about and that is the 1996 German planchette. When the first $2 coin was officially launched on February 19, 1996, an event was held where it was said that 60 million of the new coins should be made available. Not yet ready with the new technology to meet this demand, Canada actually purchased from Deutsche Nickel, a German supplier, planchettes needed to produce the first 60 million coins. The Royal Canadian Mint was able to make the first 60 million $2 coins in 1996 thanks to the production of 10 million pre-assembled planchettes by the company Deutsche Nickel in Germany. Unlike the Canadian planchette toonies, the 1996 $2 German planchette coins feature lines with a dull matte texture across the ring. It is considerably easier to distinguish between the German and Canadian planchettes when the coins are uncirculated. However, once these coins enter circulation and start to wear down, the distinguishing lines become less noticeable. Despite this, the use of German planchettes was a crucial factor in meeting the high demand for $2 coins in Canada at that time. Now before we get into the values for the 1996 German planchette toonie, first let's go over some of the basic specifications for the coin. 
The 1996 Canadian Planchette tuning was produced at a mintage figure of 350,483,000. The 1996 German Planchette was produced at a mintage figure of 10 million. The coins are composed with an outer ring of 100% nickel and an inner core of 92% copper, 6% aluminum, and 2% nickel. They have a weight of 7.3 grams, a diameter of 28 millimeters, a thickness of 1.8 millimeters. The designers for the coin are Dora de Pedri Hunt and Ago Aran for the obverse and Brent Townsend and Ago Aran for the reverse. It is magnetic and has a die axis in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian coins. So when it comes to value, a lot of the time when you are dealing with Canadian loonies and toonies, it is very rare that you will find any, even with errors or varieties that are worth a lot of money in a low grade state. Usually they have to be in a mint state to get the most amount or premium for the coin. And the German planchette, unfortunately, is not much different than the other cases. If you do find one of these and it is at the low end of the Sheldon scale, so beat up and worn and been through the meat grinder, firstly, it's going to be very hard to identify that it is a German planchette and it's not going to be worth much or anything above face value. But as you start to get into the MS scale, you start to see some pretty big price jumps for this coin. It can be worth around $80 for an MS63. It can be worth $271 for an MS65 and all the way up to $694 for an MS66, which on Coins in Canada is currently the highest graded known example. If you were to find one of these and it's scored in the MS67 range, there is no reason that it could push the $1,000 mark. This is definitely a super, super rare variety to look for, and they did make quite a few of them. 10 million is a pretty high mintage figure, but the trick in these is identifying the German planchette. It will look a little bit more greasy. You will see those dull texture lines as well. I have actually found one of these German planchette tunies in one of my hunts and I could definitely tell it apart from some of the other uncirculated 1996 Canadian planchette tunies they stand out quite a bit now just to give you a quick idea if you were to find one of the regular 1996 Canadian planchette tunies the maximum amount of money you could actually get for that coin is $78 for an MS66 so the German planchette is worth about 10 times more 10 times as rare 10 times as valuable Now, you know you're becoming a coin collector when you start referring to your pocket change as potential treasures, and finding a 1996 nickel in your pocket chain might just make your day. Coin roll hunters and collectors alike have become aware of a rare Canadian nickel error from the year 1996 that can be worth some really decent money even if it isn't in the greatest shape. If you were to check the Coins in Canada website a few years ago, you would only see two varieties listed for the 1996. These two varieties are the Near and Far 6. Usually you'd be looking for the Far 6, and that variety can actually be worth a couple hundred dollars if it hits in the high MS mark. To tell the difference between the Near and Far 6, you need to look at the final digit 6 in the date 1996, and then look at its proximity and distance to the bottom of the D in Canada. If the 6 is very close to, but not making contact or touching the D, then you have the Near 6. If there appears to be a space or gap between the number and the letter D, then you have the FAR6, and the FAR6 is actually the more valuable of the two varieties. But what if I told you that there is a third variety that is actually much more rare and valuable than the previous two? You could say one 1996 nickel to rule them all, and that is the attached six variety. Now, whether due to severe dye deterioration, cracks, or any number of other production problems that can occur during the minting process, it would seem that a rare error or variety escaped into circulation. To identify this, you need to look once again at that final digit in the date, and if that six is touching or making contact with the D in the inscription Canada, then you have yourself a fairly valuable Canadian nickel. Now before we get into the value, some of the details and specifications for this coin, if any of these are off, it might indicate that it is not legitimate. And you might think it's actually silly to check all of these little specifications, but you would be surprised at the counterfeit coins that can be purchased online these days. Coins like the 1921 half dollar and five cent piece, the 1948 silver dollars, even the 1944 tomback nickel, and even some minor modern errors and varieties, I've seen listings for all of these counterfeit coins, some of which only sell for a dollar or two. So it never hurts to be thorough, especially if you already went to the work of identifying the attached six. So the specifications for the 1996 nickel, it is composed of 75% copper, 25% nickel. It has a weight of 4.6 grams, a diameter of 21.2 millimeters, 
a thickness of 1.76 millimeters. The designers and engravers for the obverse of the coin are Dora de Pedri Hunt and Ago Aran, and G.E. Kruger Gray and Thomas Shingles for the reverse of the coin. The edge of the coin is smooth, it is non-magnetic, and it has a diaxis in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian coins. Now in terms of value, Coins in Canada doesn't actually list low-end price values. The estimate starts kicking in around AU50, and they do evaluate this coin at $134 for an AU50 example, but I do think that it is worth anywhere from $10 to $20 for a G to VG example of one of these coins. People want them. They are definitely a good example of a Canadian error and some significant die deterioration if the D is connected to that six. Now, when you start to get into the MS mark, you see some pretty high price jumps for this coin. It can be worth around $150 for an MS60. But if you are to look at the FAR6 1996, that coin can actually be worth $300 for an MS67. So I don't doubt at all that this nickel could easily be worth up to $1,000 to $5,000 for an MS67. If you were to find one that was in a high mint state, your best chance at this point of finding one that is that nice is probably from an uncirculated roll. And never say never because I have found 1967 rabbit nickel uncirculated rolls from the bank before. These were original bank rolls. So I know that there can be stuff like these 1996s out there. You just need to keep your eyes open. And if you find an uncirculated roll and there is an attached six as the ender, the chances are most of the coins inside that roll are gonna have the attached six variety. Usually when you have an error or variety, most of the coins in the roll will have the variety or none of them will because all of the coins are struck and packaged consecutively. So if you do ever happen to come across a 1996 uncirculated roll of Canadian nickels, the first thing that you can look for is this attached six. And if you do see that on the ender of the roll, I definitely suggest you buy it. But even if the entire roll is far sixes and you send them in to be graded and they score an MS66, MS67, it is still a fairly rare and valuable nickel. You do not want the 1996s with the close six. That one is the least rare and valuable of the 1996 varieties. So if you find any of those while you're coin roll hunting, just chuck them to the side. So before we do get into the value and specifications for the 1991 quarter, I thought I would go over some of the story of how a coin with such a limited mintage can actually come into existence. Coin mintage refers to the quantity of a specific coin design produced by a mint during a particular year or time period. It is a fundamental aspect of a coin's history and production. The rarity of coins is usually measured on how scarce or uncommon they are in relativity to its total mintage. Coins with lower mintages are generally considered more rare because there are fewer of them available to collectors or the public. Several factors contribute to the rarity of a coin, including mintage numbers. Coins with low mintage numbers are inherently rare. When fewer coins are minted, there are fewer available to collectors to acquire. Survival rate. The number of coins that have survived over time also affects rarity. Coins that were well preserved or saved by collectors are more likely to be available today. Melting and withdrawal. Changes in composition or economic factors like the alloy recycling program can lead to the withdrawal and melting of coins. This reduces the number of surviving specimens and increases the rarity of some dates. Coins that have garnered significant collector interest tend to be less common in the market due to collectors acquiring and holding on to them. Rarity is a critical factor in determining the value of a coin. Generally, rare coins command higher prices in the numismatic market. Collectors and investors are often willing to pay a premium for coins that are difficult to obtain due to their limited availability. The condition or grade of a rare coin can also significantly impact its value. Coins in excellent condition are more desirable to collectors and can fetch higher prices. Usually coins with low mintage figures will also hold some historical significance. They may mark a special period, event, or a change in coinage history. This historical context adds to their appeal and value. Numismatists value coin that provide insights into the past and low minted coins often do just that. Collector preferences can drive demand for specific coins. Coins that are part of a series or set have unique designs or represent specific milestones and are highly sought after. Collector demand can create competition and influence prices, particularly for rare and desirable coins. Market trends including auction results and changing collector tastes can impact the value of coins. Prices for some key dates may fluctuate based on market dynamics and also demand from buyers. 
Another major factor that could have led to the creation of the Canadian 1991 quarter is labor disputes and strikes. Labor disputes, strikes, or work stoppages at a mint can disrupt normal coin production operations. Mint employees, including coin press operators, engravers, and other key personnel may participate in strikes to demand better working conditions, higher wages, or other labor-related issues. Strikes often lead to production delays as mint facilities may operate at reduced capacity or cease production altogether during this strike period. This can result in a backlog of coins that need to be minted once the strike is resolved. A strike can directly impact the mintage numbers for a given year or denomination. If the work strike occurs during the planned production window for a particular coin, the mint might not actually be able to produce as many coins were as originally intended. This can lead to a lower mintage for the affected coin. Strikes may also affect the quality of coins produced during and immediately following the strike period. Mint employees returning to work after a strike may need some time to ensure that the coin presses and equipment are operating smoothly, potentially impacting the quality of the struck coins. In the case of the 1991 Canadian quarter, if there was indeed a strike at the Canadian Mint during that year, it could have contributed to the lower mintage of quarters for that specific date. The disruption in production and potential quality control issues may have led to a scarcity of well-struck uncirculated specimens, further enhancing the coin's rarity and desirability. Now, some of the reasons that the 1991 Canadian quarters are considered so rare compared to their counterparts in the similar date ranges. In 1991, the Canadian Mint produced a significantly lower number of these quarters compared to other years. This limited mintage is a key factor in the coin's rarity. The exact reasons for this low mintage are not always publicly disclosed by mints, but there are a few potential explanations. Economic factors. Economic conditions can influence a mint's decision to reduce coin production. In times of economic uncertainty or budget constraints, mints may reduce the production of certain denominations, including quarters, to save on costs. So, foreseeing the production of the 1992 Provincial Series, they may have actually reduced the size of the production run for 1991 quarters. I don't think they intended to reduce it that small, but that would definitely be a good reason right there. Supply and Demand if there was a surplus of quarters from previous years in circulation and a reduced demand for new quarters, the Mint may have decided to produce fewer coins to avoid an oversupply. While the reverse design of the 1991 quarter was not unique or commemorative, it's possible that the Canadian Mint still opted for a lower mintage that year based on their production plans and priorities. Over time, the low mintage of the 1991 quarter gained the attention of coin collectors and numismatists worldwide. The combination of a low mintage figure and the regular design led to increased demand among collectors, further driving up its rarity and value in the secondary market. Many of the 1991 quarters that were minted entered circulation where they endured wear and tear. As a result, finding well-preserved uncirculated specimens from that year became increasingly challenging, contributing to their rarity. So what do you say we go over some of the specifications and give you guys the potential values if you did ever discover one of these in your pocket change or coin roll hunting. So the Canadian 1991 quarter has a mintage figure of 459,000. It is composed of 100% nickel. It has a weight of 5.05 grams, a diameter of 23.88 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.58 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Dora de Pedri Hunt and Ago Aran for the obverse and Emmanuel Han for the reverse. The edge is rated, it is magnetic, and it comes in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian coins. Now one of the greatest things about this 1991 quarter is that it is a coin that retains a premium even on the low end. If you find one of these and it's all beat up and been put through the meat grinder and it's at the very bottom of the Sheldon grading scale, you can still get some decent money for it around five to ten dollars which is a decent profit considering that you only invested 25 cents to find the coin. But when you start to get into the MS region, you start to see some pretty big price jumps. It can be worth around $10 for an MS60, around $20 for an MS64, and all the way up to $120 for an MS66. And this is a coin that's value is only gonna go up over time. It doesn't just have one of the lowest mintage figures of any Canadian coin in the last 50 years, but any coin produced in North America, probably within the last 150 years. This is an incredibly rare coin, but it is one that is fairly modern and they are still floating out there. I've known several Canadian coin roll hunters that have found even a few of these in their coin roll hunts, and I know that you can find them in your pocket change too. So it is definitely a good one to keep your eyes out for. And I only see the value going up on these bad boys as time goes on.
The Voyager dollar was a coin minted in Canada from 1935 to 1986 and initially featured 80% silver content until 1968. After the year 1968, a smaller nickel version circulated until the year 1987 when it was eventually replaced by the iconic Looney. Despite being discontinued, Voyager dollar coins maintain legal tender status. In 1968, after the 1967 Centennial series, the design continued in pure nickel, marking the shift from silver. This transition also led to a reduced diameter from 36mm to 32mm, facilitating new minting processes. The series continued with occasional interruptions for circulating commemorative issues, notably in 1982 for the Constitution dollars and in 1984 for the Jacques Cartier dollar. The Constitution Act of 1982 was a vital component of Canada's Constitution and facilitated the patriation process and introduced amendments to the British North America Act of 1867, renaming it the Constitution Act of 1867. It marked a pivotal moment by enacting the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, safeguarding Aboriginal rights, and also establishing procedures for constitutional conferences and outlining future amendment processes. In 1982, Canada gained full sovereignty and concluded with the proclamation signing by Queen Elizabeth II and Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau on April 17, 1982. Now, in the year 1982, they did release two different designs for the Canadian nickel dollars. They released the regular Voyager design, and then they also released this Commemorative Constitution Act silver dollar commemorative. This is also the first time that the Royal Canadian Mint issued a commemorative and a Voyager dollar in the same year for circulation. The reverse design of the Constitution dollar draws inspiration from Robert Harris's painting, The Fathers of Confederation. Although the original painting perished in a fire in 1916, artist Rex Woods reconstructed a copy in 1968 with slight modifications, including the addition of three individuals. This iconic representation of the coin pays homage to Canada's constitutional history and commemorates the Fathers of Confederation. Now, one of the more notable errors that you can look for on a 1982 Constitution dollar is a rotated die error. The process of rotated coin dies, particularly in the context of the 1982 Constitution dollar, involves ensuring proper alignment of the dies in coin presses during the striking process. Errors can manifest when the dies experience offset, tilting, or rotation. Rotation errors specific to the 1982 dollar occur when the images on the obverse and the reverse dies are turned 180 degrees from their normal positions. These rotation errors contribute to the uniqueness and collectability of these coins as they deviate from the standard minting processes. So usually Canadian coins will come struck in metal alignment, which means that the obverse and reverse are both oriented in the same direction. But if you want to identify one of these rotated die varieties, then you want it to be in coin alignment, meaning that the obverse and reverse will be rotated 180 degrees from each other. This is usually the standard for American coins. Another interesting factor that is associated with these dollar coins is the thickness of the planchettes used to produce them. The majority of the 1982 Constitution dollars were struck on regular sized nickel planchettes while a small number were produced on a thinner planchette. Now you can go mad trying to find accurate information about the origins of such varieties, but the most likely reasons for this to occur during the minting process are the following. Planchette variation. During the preparation of coin blanks, variations in thickness may occur due to factors like the composition of the metal or the minting equipment settings. Some planchettes may be thinner than the standard thickness. Error in planchette feeding. Errors in the machinery responsible for feeding planchettes into the coin press can lead to variations in thickness. If thinner planchettes are mistakenly fed into the press, coins struck from these planchettes will exhibit thinner dimensions. Quality control issues. Issues in quality control mechanisms may result in the acceptance of planchettes that deviate from the intended specifications. If thinner planchettes are not identified and removed during quality checks, they could end up being used in the coin production process. Minting anomalies. Anomalies in the minting process, such as variations in pressure or temperature, could contribute to the creation of coins with non-standard thickness. These anomalies may be unintentional, resulting in unique and rare variations. And variability in metal composition. 
Variations in the composition of metal used for planchettes can lead to differences in physical characteristics of the coin, including the thickness. If there are any inconsistencies in the metal alloy, it may affect how the planchettes are struck. So the rare of the two different planchette varieties is the 1982 Constitution Thin Planchette. My suggestion to be able to identify one of these would be pretty simple, and that is to hold on to a standard 1982 nickel dollar and use that as a comparison. If you find any of these and it has the rotated die, and then you find that the planchette is a lot thicker when you compare and do an edge check with another standard 1982 dollar, then chances are you might have one of these rare thin planchette varieties as well. Now the mintage figure for the 1982 Constitution dollar is 11,812,000. Some of the details and specifications, it is composed of 99.9% .9 nickel, it has a weight of 15.62 grams, a diameter of 32.13 millimeters, it is magnetic and it has a die axis in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, British and Australian coins, but it does have that rotated die error that you can look for and then it will be in coin alignment which is the standard for American coins. Now, there's also a small jewel variety that you can look for on these coins, but it doesn't add much premium. If you want to be able to get the big bucks, you want to be able to find the thin planchette or a coin alignment version of this coin. So first we will start with the thin planchette in metal alignment. So this, the obverse and reverse, will both be oriented in the same direction. It will be like your standard Canadian coins, but it will have a thinner planchette. So I would compare the edge with another 1982 Constitution dollar. And if it looks like the planchette is significantly thinner, then you might have yourself a fairly rare coin. Now there aren't any low end values listed, but I would say that you could get a couple hundred dollars if you do identify the thin planchette in metal alignment. The only value that is listed is an MS-63 example, and it can be worth around $5,000. So this is one of the most rare and valuable of the Canadian nickel dollar series and definitely a good one to look for. And then you can also look for the version of the thin planchette that is in coin alignment, meaning that the obverse and reverse will be rotated 180 degrees from each other, and it will have the same orientation as American coins. Now, if you can identify the coin alignment alignment and then it also has a thin planchette it can be worth around three thousand dollars for an ms60 and all the way up to five thousand dollars for an ms63 example if you found one of these and it's not in the greatest shape i don't doubt that you could still probably get a couple hundred dollars for them especially considering that there aren't too many of these voyager dollars that are super valuable and then the last is going to be the most rare and valuable of these 1982 constitution dollars and that is the Constitution regular sized planchette in coin alignment. So this one is gonna be like American coins, the obverse and reverse will be rotated 180 degrees. In terms of its value, it can be worth around $4,500 for an MS-60, around $7,000 for an MS-63, and all the way up to $15,000 for an MS-66 example. If you did find one of these and it's on the lower end, I don't doubt that you could get anywhere from $500 to $1,000. A lot of people like to buy those 1948 silver dollars, but who knew that there was a nickel dollar that could be almost as valuable. The Canadian 1990 Bear Belly Nickel. Now this coin is a fascinating numismatic rarity that has captured the interest of collectors and enthusiasts worldwide. This unique variety is known for a distinctive error that occurred during the production process, resulting in the removal of most or some of the fur from the underbelly of the beaver depicted on the reverse side of the coin. This error has led to the coin being affectionately referred to as the bear belly variety, and it is highly sought after by collectors due to its rarity and also the intriguing story behind its creation. Now to fully understand how the Canadian 1990 bear belly nickel actually came into existence, it's essential to delve into the coin manufacturing process in Canada. The Canadian Mint, who's responsible for producing Canada's circulating coinage, employs a meticulous and multi-step approach to create coins with both precision and quality. The process begins with the design phase, where talented artists and engravers work together to craft the intricate and meaningful designs that will grace the nation's coins. In the case of the 1990 nickel, the design features the iconic image of the beaver, which is a symbol of Canada's rich natural heritage. Once the design is finalized, a master die is then created. 
This die serves as a template for producing numerous working dies, which will be used to strike the actual coins. These working dies are crucial to ensure consistent coin quality and detail. And then die polishing. Die polishing is a critical step in the coin minting process. It involves meticulously smoothing and refining the surface of the working die to ensure a high level of detail in the struck coins. This process is typically performed multiple times to maintain die quality. Now here's where the unique era of the bare belly variety comes into play. During the die polishing process for the 1990 nickel working dies, an unusual mistake occurred. Most of the fur on the underbelly of the beaver was inadvertently removed from the reverse side of the die. This error resulted in the beaver appearing to have a bare belly when the coins were struck using these specific dies. Now what makes this error even more intriguing is that the die was polished several times, leading to different degrees of apparent baldness in the beaver's underbelly on the coins produced from these dies. So depending on the significance and the amount of detail that has been removed from the fur on the beaver's belly, the coin will be either referred to as a full bear belly or a partial bear belly, and this definitely affects the value. If you wanna get the most amount of money, you are looking for the full bear belly variation. Now, before we get into the value of this coin, let's go over some of the specifications. It is composed of 75% copper, 25% nickel. It has a weight of 4.6 grams, a diameter of 21.2 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.76 millimeters. The designers and engravers for the obverse of the coin were Dora de Pedri Hunt and Ago Aran, and for the reverse of the coin, G.E. Kruger Gray and Thomas Shingles. The edge of the coin is smooth, it is non-magnetic, and it is in metal alignment, as is the standard for most Canadian coins. Now when it comes to value, this is actually a modern nickel that does hold some premium, even on the low end of the Sheldon scale. Now if you did find one of these and it's in a G4, which is beat up and put through the meat grinder, basically a parking lot coin that has almost no detail, then it is not worth much above face value. You might be able to get 50 cents to a dollar for it if somebody really wants it for their collection. But the price estimates actually start to kick in at the EF40 mark, where it is evaluated at $5 for an EF40 example, which isn't too bad for a modern nickel. It is honestly one of the most valuable and rare of the modern Canadian nickels to look for. And based on previous trends in 10 or 20 years, the value will only keep increasing and less of these will be out in circulation. So the value of the coin will definitely go up. Now, as you start to get into the MS scale, you see some decent price jumps. It can be worth around $25 for an MS60, around $55 for an MS63, and all the way up to $378 for an MS65, which is currently the highest listed price example on coins in Canada. If you were to find one and it scored in the MS66, or 67 range, there isn't any reason that you might not be able to get 500 to a thousand dollars for this coin, especially if it has the full bear belly designation as well. Now, if you were to send one of these to PCGS, they do actually attribute the bear belly variation. So if you do find one and it is in really good shape, definitely advisable that you send it off to be graded by PCGS. And if it scores in an MS66 or 67, you have yourself one incredibly rare Canadian air or variety coin. Canadian pennies, just like all other Canadian coins, feature the portrait of the reigning Canadian monarch at the time of their issuance. Queen Elizabeth II's likeness graced the penny's obverse starting in the year 1953. Over the years, her image underwent several noteworthy design updates. The first of these alterations occurred in the year 1965, following another in the year 1990, which introduced a fresh perspective courtesy of artist Dora DePadre Hunt. Finally, in the year 2003, Susanna Blunt's updated rendition of Queen Elizabeth II was introduced, showcasing the evolving artistry on Canadian coinage. One distinctive commemorative exception took place in the year 1967 as part of Canada's centennial celebrations. During the special occasion, a unique reverse side was introduced featuring a captivating depiction of a rock. This artistic masterpiece was created by the talented Canadian artist Alex Coville. Now what makes the 1967 penny so noteworthy is this is the only commemorative design where the iconic 1937 maple leaf was not used on the penny. It's an interesting piece of numismatic history that sets the 1967 penny apart. However, the penny's journey eventually concluded in the year 2012. Due to rising manufacturing costs and also inflation, the Canadian Mint ceased production of the penny. It is still considered legal tender in Canada, but it is no longer used in daily transactions. Now, an intriguing facet of Canadian pennies lies in their edges. 
While most pennies have a traditional round or smooth edge, Canadian pennies minted from 1982 to 1996 featured a distinctive 12-sided edge. This unique design element might seem quite insignificant, but it actually served quite a noble purpose, which was to aid the visually impaired in identifying the coin with ease. However, when the mint faced challenges in applying the 12-sided shape to the 1997 copper-plated zinc coin, they returned to the familiar round shape. But this transition is an interesting note in the penny's design history, emphasizing functionality alongside aesthetics. The eventual fate of the Canadian penny had long been a subject of debate, primarily due to concerns over its production costs and perceived lack of practicality. In mid-2010, the Standing Senate Committee on National Finance initiated a comprehensive study on the future of the one-cent coin. Ultimately, on December 14th of that year, the Senate Finance Committee recommended the removal of the penny from circulation. Their argument rested on the premise that a century of inflation had significantly eroded the value and utility of the Canadian one cent piece. Despite evidence that a decreasing percentage of Canadians were still actively using pennies, there were only actually 37% that were still using pennies as of a 2007 survey. The government did continue to mint the coin approximately 816 million pennies annually, equating to a staggering 24 pennies for every Canadian. The success of production was largely a consequence of pennies vanishing from circulation as people either hoarded them away or simply refrained from using them. In the year 2011, the Canadian Mint's production of pennies soared to 1.1 billion, more than doubling the 2010 figure of 486.2 million pennies. By late 2010, it was estimated that the average Canadian had stashed away as many as 600 pennies, effectively removing them from circulation. The pivotal moment arrived on March 29, 2012, when the federal government announced in its budget that the penny would be phased out of circulation in the fall of that year. The decision was largely attributed to the startling fact that producing a single penny cost 1.6 cents, a clear financial burden. The Canadian Mint struck the last penny for circulation at their facility in Winnipeg, Manitoba on May 4, 2012. And you can actually find that penny at the Bank of Canada's museum in Ottawa. Now, most importantly, existing pennies retained their status as legal tender indefinitely. However, they were withdrawn from general circulation on February 4th, 2013, in accordance with the Currency Act. With the elimination of the penny, cash transactions in Canada underwent a significant change. Instead of individual item rounding, the rounding process now applied to the total bill of sale. Totals ending in one or two are rounded down to the nearest multiple of five cents, which is zero. Totals ending in three, four, six, or seven round down or up to five cents, and totals ending in zero or nine round up to 10 cents. Though it did seem strange at first, eventually this adjustment became the new norm for Canadian cash transactions, marking the end of an era for the beloved one cent coin. Now before we get into the 1978 and 1979 pennies, I just briefly want to go over machine doubling with you guys so you have a pretty good idea of how to identify the errors on these coins. Now machine doubling occurs when a coin is struck by the coin press more than once in quick succession or there is a slight shift or bounce in the coin press during the striking process. It can also occur due to deterioration in the die and some of the characteristics of machine doubling are caused by a misalignment of the coin die with the planchette, a minor shift or vibration of the coin press during the striking, or a loose or slightly damaged or deteriorated die. Now the visual characteristics of machine doubling. Machine doubling results in a few key visual characteristics. Parallel or shelf-like doubling. The doubling lines tend to be parallel to the original design, creating a shelf-like effect. Genuine doubled dies usually show doubling in various directions. And a lack of spread. Unlike true doubled dies, machine doubling does not exhibit the spread or separation between doubled elements. Instead, the doubled features appear squeezed together. Now, machine doubling does not always enhance the value of a coin. In fact, sometimes it can actually make its desirability a little bit less among collectors. Collectors usually seek coins with strong and clear design elements, and machine doubling actually detracts from the coin's visual appearance, but it is still an error or variety that can be attributed to coins, and certain dates are well known for having machine doubling like the 1980 Canadian nickel and the pennies that we are discussing today. Now, when it comes to the Canadian 1978 and 1979 pennies, you are looking to identify machine doubling on the date. 
There can be several different degrees of doubling and they are differentiated by the amount of digits in the date that contain this machine doubling. So depending on how many of the digits are affected, the value generally increases and they are evaluated from right to left. So the doubling can start on the final number in the date and happen only on that number or it can work its way digit by digit to the left and can affect each or all of the different numbers in the date. Depending on how many of these numbers have the doubling, the value typically increases, but the severity of the doubling can also increase its potential value. Let's say you have an example of this coin where the final two digits are attributed with doubling, but it is much more significant and severe than another example with the entire date attributed. It might actually be more desirable to collectors due to the severity of this error. Some of the details and specifications for the 1978 and 1979 Canadian pennies, they're composed of 98% copper, 0.5% tin, and 1.5% zinc. They have a weight of 3.24 grams, a diameter of 19.05 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.55 millimeters. The coins were designed and engraved by Arnold Mockin for the obverse and G.E. Kruger Gray for the reverse. The edge is smooth, they are non-magnetic, and the die axis is in metal alignment, as is the standard for most Canadian, Australian, and British coins. Now, when it comes to estimating how much these coins can be worth, they are not super valuable on the low end. You might be able to get a premium for them, especially because they are Canadian pennies. I usually say when it comes to coins, it's not how much it is worth, it's how much you can get somebody to pay for it. That doesn't mean that you should rip people off, but a lot of the time people are willing to overpay for things because they simply want to add it to their collection. Not me, not myself. I have certain things that I go for and like to collect, but everybody has their own preferences. So what I'm going to do is go through and give you guys the values for each of the different attributions of doubling that you can get on these coins. So the 1978, if it has just a doubled eight on it, is worth around $10 for an MS-64, but it can be worth all the way up to around $7. $70 for an MS-66 example, which isn't too much more than the regular 1978. Now, as you start to increase in severity of the machine doubling, if it has the final two digits doubled, so the seven and the eight, you're seeing about a $10 to $15 price jump. It can be worth around $20 for an MS-64 and all the way up to $85 for an MS-66 example. Now, it doesn't get much more valuable if you only identify the three final digits in the date. So if the nine, seven, and eight all have doubling, it could be worth around $25 for an MS-64 and 87 for an MS-66. So that is a $2 price jump. But the most valuable of all of the varieties that you can look for is with the entire date containing the machine doubling. So all of the digits in the date, one, nine, seven, and eight, will have machine doubling. It can be worth around $30 for an MS-64 and 118 for an MS-66. Now you might be thinking to yourself, I'm probably never gonna find any of these super rare error coins, but I can tell you that these are much more common than you would think. I have found quite a few 1978 and 1979 pennies with machine doubling, some with the entire date, some with single digits, some that are super severe, and some not so much. And a lot of the time when I come across Canadian pennies, they are in pretty decent shape, especially the ones from the 70s and 80s, because they didn't see too much circulation before they were pulled out in the year 2012. So now let's get into the 1979 double variety pennies. First is the single double nine, so that is the final digit in the date 1979. We'll have machine doubling. It can be worth around $10.90 for an MS-64 and all the way up to $453, which is actually the exact same value as the regular 1979. So there is no premium if you only identify doubling in a single digit. And the value pretty much stays the same, honestly, as you go up. If you can identify doubling for the final three digits, you do see a slight price jump. It can be worth around $10 for an MS-63 and all the way up to $60 for an MS-66. So maybe a dollar more than the regular one. But the variety that you do want to look for is all four of the digits containing doubling and you will get a pretty decent premium for this coin. It can be worth around $15 for an MS-64 and the highest graded known example currently is an MS-66 which is evaluated at $131. If you were to find one and it scored an MS-67 you could easily be talking a thousand dollar penny because the regular 1979 without doubling is around $500. And if you identify machine doubling on the entire date, that coin is worth about twice as much as the regular 1979. 
The Royal Canadian Mint is known for producing coins not only for Canada but also for a variety of other countries. This practice is often referred to as contract coinage or foreign coin production, and here are some examples of the countries for which the Royal Canadian Mint has struck or produced coins. Bermuda, Barbados, Jamaica, Bahamas, Fiji, Cayman Islands, Trinidad and Tobago, Eastern Caribbean states, Cook Islands, and New Zealand. The Royal Canadian Mint has produced coins for New Zealand as demonstrated by the 1985 Canadian Mule Dollar, which was muled with a New Zealand obverse die, which is actually the coin that we are discussing in this video today. These examples demonstrate the international reach and reputation of the Canadian Mint for producing high quality coins for countries all around the world. The Canadian Mint's involvement in foreign coin production helps these countries create beautifully designed coins and ensures the quality and security of their coinage. Accidentally striking Canadian coins on foreign planchettes is a rare but fascinating occurrence in the world of numismatics. This phenomenon typically happens due to errors or irregulations in the minting process. Here's a brief description of how this can actually occur. The first step is planchette acquisition. The minting process begins with the acquisition of planchettes, which are small, flat, round pieces of metal. Planchettes are typically sourced from specialized suppliers. In most cases, the mint intends to use planchettes made from a specific alloy or composition, such as copper nickel for Canadian coins. Another step is plant inspection. Before the actual minting process begins, planchettes are inspected for quality and composition. This step is crucial to ensuring that the coins produced meet the specified standards. Planchettes that don't meet these standards are typically set aside for melting and recycling. Feeding and presses. Planchettes that pass inspection are fed into the coin presses, where they are struck with the design and details for the coin. Each coin press is set up for a specific denomination and composition, as well as a particular design. Die chambers. Inside the coin press, there are die chambers that house the obverse and reverse designs. These dies have the design and inscriptions that are to be transferred onto the planchette. The dies exert a significant amount of pressure onto the planchette to create the coin's design. Sometimes due to errors or malfunctions in the planchette feeding system, foreign planchettes can find their way into coin presses. These foreign planchettes may have different compositions and designs intended for the coins from other countries. The striking process. When a foreign planchette is inadvertently fed into the press, it goes through the striking process just like a regular planchette. The high pressure from the dies causes the design and details from the Canadian coin dies to be transferred onto the foreign planchette. The result is a Canadian coin with the intended design but struck on this foreign planchette. This creates a unique and rare air coin known as a wrong planchette or also a mule coin. These coins are often highly sought after by collectors due to their rarity and unusual nature. Now to be able to identify and differentiate between the regular 1985 and the New Zealand mule you need to look for the following details. The reverse side of the coin displays a distinctive Canadian design that was commonly featured on the Canadian dollar coins until the year 1987. This design showcases a voyager or a man and a child inside of a canoe, paying homage to Canada's history of exploration and trade. There are no New Zealand motifs or inscriptions on the reverse side of the coin. Now this error actually occurred at some point during the minting process when the dies intended for the New Zealand $1 coins were mistakenly paired with the Canadian dollar planchettes. This mismatch resulted in a small number of coins with the New Zealand obverse design on one side and the standard Canadian reverse design on the other side of the coin. The Canadian 1985 dollar coin muled with the New Zealand obverse is highly sought after by collectors due to its rarity and intriguing combination of Canadian and New Zealand elements. These air coins are relatively scarce and their value can vary significantly based on factors such as condition and also collector demand. In good condition, they can command a significant premium over their face value. If you do believe that you have one of these air coins, it is definitely advisable to have it authenticated and graded by a reputable coin grading service such as PCGS or NGC. Professional grading can provide assurance of authenticity and they also assign a numerical grade based on the 70 point Sheldon scale, which can severely impact the coin's value in the collector market. You also want to be super careful of counterfeit examples of coins like this. If you are buying one of these off of a site like eBay or on an online auction and it is not graded in, in a slab, I would definitely be skeptical. You can definitely find coins like this one or even the 1944 Tombac and other Canadian air coins that there are counterfeit examples of out there. They are very cheap, only a dollar or two to buy online 
and you can make a huge profit if you only pay a dollar or two for a coin like that and then you sell it for the buku dollars that some of these legitimate examples are worth so you definitely want to do your due diligence the following specifications are for the 1985 mule dollar if any of these are off it might indicate that it is not a legitimate or authentic example now the year on the coin is 1985 the denomination is one dollar it is composed of nickel the weight is 15.6 grams it has a diameter of 32.1 millimeters the shape of the coin is round the edge is reeded it is magnetic and the die axis is in metal alignment as is the standard for most canadian australian and british coins even this mule is actually in metal alignment now when it comes to value i would definitely say that this 1985 mule dollar could be considered a holy grail of the voyager series from 1968 until 1967 there aren't too many of them that are worth a lot of money especially over the thousand dollar mark but this is definitely a good one to look for you can actually go to banks here in canada and ask them if they have any silver dollars sometimes collectors will actually turn their nickel silver dollars in or someone will inherit a collection and they will turn them into the bank for face value and then if you are lucky and they happen to have any you can actually buy them off the bank for face value i've been able to get close to a hundred dollars at one time from a bank in voyager dollars and it is definitely a good way to be able to search for errors like this now in terms of value on the low end it can be worth around six thousand four hundred dollars for an au50 so even if you found one of these coins and it is beat up and put through the meat grinder you're going to be talking five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars because it is so rare and struck on a foreign planchette you just don't come across examples like this too often now when you start getting into the ms region it can be worth around nine thousand eight hundred dollars for an ms60 and all the way up to fourteen thousand seven hundred dollars for an ms63 which as we know right now is the highest graded known example currently if you were to find one and it scored any higher you could easily be talking a twenty five thousand to fifty thousand dollar coin depending on what kind of grade it gets Canadian air coins come into existence during the minting process due to various factors such as problems with coin dies, planchette quality, striking pressure, and other mechanical issues. These errors can manifest in different forms and affect the appearance of the coins. Here's a brief overview of some of the different errors and varieties that you can look for on Canadian coins that can make them more valuable. The first are die errors. These are errors related to the coin dies, including double dies, die cracks, and die clashes. Double dies occur when the die is engraved with multiple impressions of the design, leading to doubled or overlapping features on the coin. Die cracks and die clashes result from damage to the die itself and can create unique patterns on the coin. There are also planchette errors. Planchette errors occur when the coin's blank metal disc or planchette is imperfect. These errors include off-center strikes, planchette clips, and that is where a portion of the planchette is missing and planchette flaws like laminations or cracks. I've actually found a Canadian 1980 penny with a clipped planchette in one of my coin roll hunts. It was definitely one of my greatest finds to date and super awesome to be able to find that. I think I sold it for like three to five dollars at the coin shop one day. So you definitely can get a premium for these coins if they have a significant error. There are also striking errors. Striking errors happen during the coin press operation. They include coin blanks that are not properly centered, resulting in off-center strikes. Collar errors can lead to irregular shapes while overstrikes occur when a coin is struck multiple times with different dies. And then there are mechanical errors. This happens with mechanical issues in the coin press, and it can lead to errors like machine doubling where the design is flattened or appears doubled due to the die moving during the strike. And that is actually what happened on the coin that we are discussing today, the 1980 double date nickel. Now, how do these error attributions affect the value and rarity of these coins? Well, first for double dies, these are among the most sought after errors, especially if they exhibit strong doubling and are well preserved. They can command significant premiums from collectors. A great example of a double die would be the 1955 Lincoln Penny with a double dyed obverse. The date is double struck on that coin and it is very significant. There are also die cracks and clashes. While not as valuable as double dies, coins with distinctive die cracks or clashes can still be desirable to collectors, particularly if the error is prominent and it is featured on an older piece. Planchette errors. Off-center strikes and major planchette errors can increase a coin's value, but it often depends on the specific error's visibility and the impact on the design and features of the coin. Striking errors. 
Off center strikes and over strikes may have numismatic value, especially if they result in visually appealing and unique patterns. And then probably one of the most common is machine doubling, especially amongst Canadian coins before the year 1990. Errors like machine doubling are much more common and will generally have lower values compared to other rare air types like double dies. The value and rarity of Canadian air coins are usually determined by various factors. Collectors often appreciate air coins not only for their unique characteristics, but also for the stories and the history behind each piece. Now, when it comes to the Canadian 1980 nickel, to be able to get the most amount of money for this coin, you need to be able to identify significant machine doubling on the date. Now, here is some information on machine doubling and how to identify it on your coins to potentially make them more valuable. Usually, if a Canadian coin is in a high grade and exhibits an air or variety such as machine doubling, it will add a premium to the coin, but there are usually notable dates to look for, like the 1980 nickel, that can make it worth far more than its face value. Now, here are some of the characteristics of machine doubling. Now, some of this may get a little bit technical, but I do want to be thorough and give you guys a very good understanding of what to look for. But the first thing that we want to look for is narrowing of the high points. One of the key features of machine doubling is that it causes the highest points of the coin's design to appear slightly narrower at the top. This effect is due to the flattening of a portion of the primary image during the coin striking process. Machine doubling errors encompass several subtypes, including ejection doubling. This occurs when a coin sticks to the die during ejection from the press, and there is also die chatter. Die chatter refers to minor differences in the design caused by vibrations or imperfections in the die surface. There's also horizontal twisting or vibration. When a die is slightly loose or misaligned during the striking process, it may twist horizontally or vibrate at the end of the strike. As the die returns to its original position, it can release this twist and push the metal on the side and upward, resulting in doubling. Machine doubling will usually appear on letters, numbers, and the main design. The reason that these coins are considered rare and do hold a premium above face value is usually when quality control personnel notice machine doubling, they will take corrective actioning by tightening the part of the coin press that holds the die to resolve the issue, thus not too many of these will actually make it out. Now machine doubling is one of the most common types of errors found on coins. It is generally more prevalent than rare and more sought after errors like double dies. Machine doubling is a frequently encountered error on Canadian coins resulting from issues during the coin striking process. And while machine doubling is generally less rare and sought after by collectors compared to more distinctive errors, understanding these nuances will help collectors and yourself accurately identify and assess these coins and their values. Now what do you say we get into the coin that you guys are all here to find out about and that is the 1980 nickel with machine doubling on the date and it can also happen on the lettering for Canada right above the date. So if you can identify the machine doubling it will almost look like the date is 3D. That is the best Best way that I can put it to an amateur if you are looking and try to identify this the specifications for the 1980 Canadian nickel is composed of 100% nickel alloy it has a weight of 4.54 grams a diameter of 21.2 millimeters and a thickness of 1.75 millimeters the coin was designed and engraved by Arnold Mockin and Walter Ott for the obverse and GE Kruger Gray and Thomas Shingles for the reverse. The edge of the coin is smooth, it is magnetic, and it has a die axis and metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian coins. Now in terms of value, getting accurate price estimates for the 1980 coin, if it does have doubling on the date, can be pretty tricky. Coins in Canada does actually list this error on their website, but they don't list a lot of values for it, honestly. The values start to kick in at the MS60 mark and they top out at the MS63. So Coins in Canada appraises this piece around $13.90 for an MS60, around $20 for an MS62, and all the way up to $30 for an MS63. But if you compare that to the 1980 without machine doubling, it is significantly more valuable. For example, the 1980 without machine doubling is only worth around a dollar for an MS63. So if it does have the double date, it is worth around 30 times more. So if you do extrapolate that upwards, I estimate that you could easily get anywhere from 200 to $1,000 for one of these pieces if it's scored between an MS65 and MS67. Unfortunately, PCGS does not attribute this error or variety yet but they may eventually one day because it has become quite notable over the last few years if you were to find someone that's really into air coins you might have no problem 
getting a couple hundred dollars for this piece so it is definitely a good one to have on your radar you should definitely throw your 1980 nickels to the side and check them with a microscope or zoom in real close on that date with your phone and if you can identify that machine doubling you may have a valuable coin in terms of the low end value i'm not going to say that it's worth very much if it's hovering somewhere around the au mark you might be able to get a couple dollars if somebody really wants it and they are into air coins but usually to get the most amount of money out of these coins you want them to be in a high mint state so that means m MS65 to MS67. Canadian penny produced from the year 1858 to 2012 is a discontinued coin with a value of one cent or one one hundredth of a Canadian dollar. Although officially called the one cent piece, the terms penny and cent are commonly used. The adoption of penny likely stems from Canada's historical use of the British monetary system before the year 1858. Production of the Canadian penny officially ceased in May of 2012 and distribution stopped in February of 2013, making it no longer circulated but still legal tender. Vendors are not obligated to return pennies as change in Canada and rounding to the nearest 5 cents is encouraged for cash transactions. Pricing in 1 cent increments is still possible for non-cash transactions like credit cards. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, the Canadian 1964 penny has a very high mintage figure of over 400 million and usually when so many of a certain date is produced, there will be some errors or varieties associated with that date simply because they had to produce so many of them. These are some of the factors that can lead to there being errors or varieties on certain high mintage years for coins. Die wear and deterioration. With a high number of coins being minted, dyes undergo considerable wear and deterioration. As the dyes wear out, they may lose details or develop anomalies that result in errors on the coins struck. Die clashes. In high volume minting, the dyes can clash against each other more frequently. Die clashes occur when dies strike each other without a planchette or a blank coin between them, leading to the transfer of details from one die to another, creating distinct errors on subsequent strikes. Variations in die quality. High mintages often mean that multiple sets of dies are employed in the minting process. Variations in die quality, such as differences in engraving depth or details, can contribute to creations of various coin varieties and errors. This increases the probability of anomalies. The higher the mintage, sometimes the greater the probability of anomalies during the minting process. Anomalies can include dyed chips, dyed cracks, and other irregularities that can contribute to the uniqueness of each coin. The notable errors for the 1964 Canadian pennies, such as the extra spine, hanging four, missing MG, and the dot, could be attributed to these factors. The high mintage provided more opportunities for variations in die quality, increased instances of die clashes, and also increased the chance of anomalies, resulting in the creation of these distinct errors and varieties for collectors to discover. The large production volume of 1964 pennies adds a layer of intrigue and diversity to the numismatic landscape for that particular year. So what I will do is go through each of the different varieties and show you what you will need to look for to identify that particular error. And then once we have shown you each of the different varieties, we will break down the value for each of these coins. So first we're gonna discuss the 1964 extra spine variety. The occurrence of an extra spine on the maple leaf could be attributed to a variety of factors during the die creation process. It might result from a die clash or an anomaly during the engraving or hubbing stages. Die clashes where dies strike each other without a planchette in between can cause unexpected details to be transferred from one die to another, leading to the creation of this extra spine. Now to identify what you want to do is look in between the two top branches of the maple leaf and there should be a small extra spine protruding from the top right hand side. I will show an example of what you need to look for. Next up is going to be the 1964 Hanging 4. Now in the past for the 1962 pennies, I have discussed the Hanging 2 varieties and these are basically the same, but instead you're looking to identify this die clash on the 4 instead of the 2. The Hanging 4 is typically a result of a die clash where the dies used to strike the coin come into contact without a planchette between them. This collision can cause the metal to shift and can create anomalies in the struck coin. 
The die clashes might have occurred due to the issues in die alignment or due to problems during the striking process, leading to this distinctive hanging appearance of the numeral four, where basically it will look like there is a hook that is going above and running to the left of the top of the last digit four in the date 1964. Now there can also be double hanging fours and even triple hanging fours. So the more of these lines or die clashes that you can identify will add to the number of of hanging fours on your 1964 Canadian penny. Now next up is the 1964 missing MG. Now the absence of the initials MG, which designates the coins designer Mary Gillick, may be due to die deterioration, wear, or damage during the minting process. Dies undergo significant stress and wear over time, and if not properly maintained or replaced, certain details such as small initials may fail to transfer onto the coins during striking. Usually, if you are looking for the small MG initials, you would look on the very bottom of Queen Elizabeth's bust running along the line of her shoulder, and there should be a small MG initial. Now, in the case of the missing MG variety, it should be absent from the bottom of Queen Elizabeth's bust. And last but not least is the rarest of the 1964 varieties, which is the 1964 dot. The presence of a dot above the digit 9 in the date 1964 could have multiple explanations. It might be the result of a die chip, which a small piece of the die had broken off and leaves an impression on the struck coin. It could also be a cud, where a raised area by a portion of the die becomes worn or damaged. There is also the small possibility that the marking is intentionally put there by the Canadian Mint to distinguish them from other Canadian 1964 pennies, but that is much less likely. The rarity of the dot and its distinct appearance contribute to its desirability among collectors. Now to identify the dot on the 1964 dot penny, what you want to do is look above the digit of 9 in the date and there should be a small dot there. It is pretty pronounced and detailed. Even though allegedly it is not intentional, it does look like from the examples that I have seen like it was almost intentionally put there but it basically is a small die chip or cud located above the digit of nine. Now, before we go over the values of these coins, some of the details and specifications, the overall mintage figure for the Canadian 1964 penny is 484 million. 655,322. It is composed of 98% copper, 0.5% tin, and 1.5% zinc. It is non-magnetic. It has a weight of 3.24 grams, a diameter of 19.05 millimeters. The edge is plain. It has a die axis and metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, British, and Australian coins. The obverse was designed and engraved by Mary Gillick and the reverse by GE Kruger Gray. So let's get into the values for these 1964 penny varieties. What I will do is start with the least valuable and work my way up to the most rare and viable of the different varieties. So first we're gonna start off with the extra spine variety. Now, if you can identify the extra spine, it doesn't add too much premium for any of these varieties on the low end. You might be able to get a couple dollars if you sell them online or to someone who is super into errors or varieties. But for the most part, you want these coins to be in pretty good condition which is not impossible i have done a few penny hunts and i have found 1950s pennies that are in mint state so if you find a roll of 1964s that is probably your best chance if you bust it open but you can still find mint state pennies if you are able to get your hands on a box or a couple of rolls from the bank now if you can identify the extra spine which will have that small extra spine located between the two top branches of the maple leaf on the reverse of the coin. It can be worth around $20 for an MS64 example. Next up is the 1964 Hanging Four. Once again, to identify the Hanging Four variety, what you wanna do is look for a small die clash, which will look like a line or a hook running along the four in the date 1964. If you can identify that, it can be worth around $20 for an MS64 and all the way up to $100 for an MS66, which is about twice as valuable as the regular 1964 penny without any errors or varieties attributed to it. And then we have the missing MG penny. If you can identify the missing MG, which will be missing the initials of Mary Gillick along the bottom of Queen Elizabeth II's bust on the obverse of the coin, it can be worth around $104 for an MS64 
and around $170 for an MS-65. This is one of the more rare of the 1964 varieties and definitely a good one to look for. If you're finding 1964s that are pretty beat up and worn, I wouldn't even bother looking for the missing MG initials because chances are it could have just worn off with circulation. So you want one of these to be on a mint state example. And then last but not least, we have the rarest of the 1964 penny varieties, the 1964 dot. Once again, to identify this, you want to look above the 9 in the date 1964, and you want to look for a small dot. Now, whether this dot is a die chip cut or it was put there intentionally, it does not matter. If you can find this pronounced dot above the 9 on your 1964 penny, it can make it an extremely rare and valuable coin, especially if it is in the mint state range. It can be worth anywhere from $1,000 to $3,000 from an MS-65 to MS-66 example if you were able to identify the 1964 dot and it is worn and beat up i would still send it in to be attributed by iccs and it can still probably be worth anywhere from 10 to 50 dollars depending on how bad somebody wants the coin now, what do you guys think about these 1964 penny errors? What would you do if you ever found a legitimate example or if you ever have found any of the coins discussed in this video? Let me know down in the comments. I would love to know. Also, I would really appreciate if you guys would smash that thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and also ring that bell notification so you can follow along with my new content as it is being released. But I think that is pretty much going to do it for this one, folks. So until the next one, everybody, peace out and have a good one, y'all.